So the next type of therapy we're going to talk about is behavioral therapy. Um, and as we already learned earlier in the year, behavioral psychology is the approach um, of psychology that's going to be looking at changing environmental factors or changing uh, someone's actions uh, in order to change their outcomes. Um, so behavioral therapy is definitely distinct from insight therapy. Uh, the goal of insight therapy, um, like the humanistic or the psychoanalytic or the psychodynamic, is for someone to have a cognitive realization of something and that realization then to drive change. With behavioral therapy, um, the goal is to take learning principles, so be thinking conditioning, um, classical and operant, uh, in order to eliminate unwanted behaviors. Um, so the first application of behavioral therapy that we're going to look at is counter conditioning. Uh, counter conditioning is where you use classical conditioning uh, in order to take maybe a maladaptive response and then sub in a better one. Um, so one example of counter conditioning uh, is going to be to treat phobias. Um, individuals who have a phobia when presented with a specific type of um, trigger will respond with unwanted behavior, um, certainly emotional behavior as well as physical behavior. Uh, and so one of the goals of exposure therapy um, for treating a phobia is to substitute a new calm, relaxed response uh, to exposure to the thing that you're phobic of. Um, so there are actually, actually a couple different types of exposure therapies. Um, all of them work on the same principle, that if you are going to gain a new response uh, to something, you need to be exposed to that something in the first place. Uh, so one of the really popular forms of exposure therapy is called systematic desensitization. Um, I'm going to link you to this video uh, in the YouTube description so you can watch it. Um, but systematic desensitization is when you gradually introduce the thing that someone is phobic of while pairing that introduction with relaxation techniques. So if you had a phobia of snakes, for example, with systematic desensitization, first you learn some calming techniques. You learn how to control your breathing. Um, you would learn how to maybe um, do some biofeedback and control your respiration and your heart rate. Um, and so you'd first learn how to keep yourself calm. Then you would slowly maybe be shown a picture of a snake. And that might make you, that might trigger your anxiety response. So then you'd focus on those breathing and relaxation techniques you'd learned. And then once you could handle seeing a picture of a snake, maybe you'd look at a video. And once you could handle that, um, maybe they'd bring a snake into the room next door and tell you it was there. And then like gradually you get closer and closer until you're interacting with the snake. Um, that's one option. Um, this is based on the work of early behavioral uh, psychologist Mary Cover Jones, um, who actually she worked with um, a young boy named Peter uh, who had a fear of a rabbit, and she was able to um, gradually, through exposure therapy, get him to associate the rabbit with a feeling of liking by linking it with candy. Um, and then this also um, links up to the work of Joseph Wolf, uh, who does a lot of um, research into how we have uh, anxiety hierarchies, that when we have a phobia, um, it's important for a therapist to understand um, what does the phobia ultimately like lead to? Like, what are the most anxiety-provoking situations for that phobia? So that you can learn, well, the worst thing that could happen for someone with the phobia of snakes is they really believe that, like, holding the snake means the snake is going to kill them. Um, but they're not as freaked out uh, if they just have to see the snake. And they're even less freaked out if someone, like, talks to them about snakes. And so you figure out, like, what is the most anxiety-provoking? And then you build a hierarchy down. So as you're going through systematic desensitization, you start with the lowest rung on that anxiety hierarchy. Um, aversive conditioning uh, is another form of counter conditioning. Uh, this is when um, you are trying to get someone to associate a bad habit uh, with um, a response that is unpleasant. So um, examples, um, if someone uh, has a bad habit of like biting their nails, um, one of the things that you could do, and maybe some of you had this done to you when you were kids, is you could put like apple cider vinegar on uh, their fingernails. And so every time they went to put their nail in their mouth, they would get that gross taste of the apple cider vinegar. Um, and they'd gradually over time learn to link biting their nails with that like nasty taste and they'd stop it. Um, there's some medications that make people feel nauseous if those meds are mixed with alcohol. The idea being that um, you condition someone to link alcohol with feelings of nausea using some taste aversion so that they stop drinking.
And then we have uh, behavioral modification. Uh, this is when we're not just using um, like classical conditioning, where we're really now going to be trying to change like large scale behaviors. Um, and so I'm actually going to link you to these videos as well. Um, it won't work if I start playing them while I'm screen recording. I think that will, it'll just end up being a disaster. Um, but these videos are going to show um, different behavioral modification techniques being used um, in especially young children to teach them how to um, engage in school and in social situations effectively by using different systems, um, sticker charts, um, rewards, punishers, maybe token economies, uh, a couple things we can go over um, on the next slide. Um, one of the things that's really successful with teaching children appropriate behaviors um, is implementing what's called the token economy. Um, this has been helpful in applied behavioral analysis for children who are on the autism spectrum. This is actually also utilized in different types of institutions. Um, mental institutions would be one, um, prisons would be another. Um, everyday normal school is also a place where you might see this. Um, and a token economy is where you have like specific behaviors you're supposed to be completing. And if you complete um, one of those behaviors, then you earn some sort of token, a sticker, a check mark, a point. And if you earn enough of those tokens, you can then cash them in for a larger prize or privilege. Um, another place you might have seen this is like a Chuck E. Cheese or a Dave and Buster.